Tonight, we're going to be talking on the benefits and challenges of operationalizing analytics. And uh, a beautiful quote that says, the inability to integrate analytic solutions into workflows and achieve frontline adoption is the number one inhibitor to why data and analytics initiatives fail. So I'm not trying to start with a doom and gloom story here, but all I'm trying to say is uh, that there is a reason why analytics fails. My name is Ronald Christopher. I work for a company called SAS. We've been in the analytics business for over four decades, trusted leaders in the space of analytics. I'm not trying to sell you anything, by the way. All I'm trying to say is the message that you're going to hear tonight is the message that we've crafted after four decades of having tried to do this with over 17,000 customers across the planet and about 85,000 installations of our platform in the analytics space. We've seen a plethora of issues, and what I'm speaking to you is the latest in what we are seeing as the marketplace challenge. So if you're out there in the analytics ecosystem and you're building systems that businesses rely on, one of the key things to understand is that there are chances that your analytic deployment will fail. And so the chances of that, that you can reduce the chance of failure, is by taking steps about which that I'm going to be talking about this evening. So challenges that lurk beneath the surface with operationalizing analytics. What do we see out there? There's a plethora of coding techniques that are available. People are trying to do different things. This causes silos and issues across the board. Manual coding and duplication, again, creates exhaustive costs in the ecosystem when you're looking at overall analytics. The inability to take a model that's at a very small scale and deploy it across the enterprise, which means if it works for one system and you're trying to get it out to the entire organization, that is highly restricted these days and also takes a long time to do. There's no continuous method for model degradation and studying how quickly a model deploys. The studies show us that it takes anywhere between three to six months for a model to get deployed into production. Now, in that time, a model could degrade. The factors that cause that model to predict outcomes successfully can go through significant change. Another important observation that we've seen over these last few months and years of doing this is that production process is often siloed away. In a sense, DevOps is operating differently from model ops. So there are two terms that I'm going to be speaking on interchangeably today. Model ops is the core functionality that deals with the design and development and bringing models into production, not productionalizing them per se. And DevOps is basically taking what you develop and putting it into production so that the business can actually utilize it. A lot of the effort, as we see, is spent in what we call under the surface. You know, you see this huge ice cube. The business decisions are only the top strata that, 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 that has real visibility. So a lot of the things that happens behind the scenes in what we call the analytics ecosystem are pretty much hidden to the business, and that's why sometimes business cannot resonate the true value of, of analytics per se. The development and deployment life cycle alone costs business about 80% that is not visible to them in terms of tangible results. So when you look at that, there are things that we have to do to make sure that there is education across the board, or there's going to be failure in terms of expectations set. Now, we are all here in the analytic community. Can I see a show of hands on how many of you develop models today? How many of you have models that are already deployed in production and are running for some company, some entity? There you go. So we are all in this business. Now, wouldn't it be absurd if all the models that we are developing and doing the things behind the scene never get noticed? That's typically the story today. Analytics is hidden jargon. People don't understand it. The business has not come to a place to understand it. So the thing that we have to do is to be able to rationalize that gap and also looking at what happens. So typically what we see here in this is the slide where, where we're looking at the cycle that usually analytics goes through, from data to discovery to deployment. You start with the preparation of data. It takes weeks or months to get your data together and all cleansed and ready. Then it takes days to explore it, to come, to come some kind of sense as to whether it's usable or not. And then, again, weeks to design or develop a model. But where do you go from there? Do you have a central repository across the organization to be able to deploy it and store it, catalog it? Is that something that's commonplace today? Then going from there, how does it get deployed? Now, we talk about analytics today. The, the, the data that is available needs to turn into actionable insights. 
So the deployment part sometimes takes from weeks to months because it has to go through an exhaustive gating process, testing behind the scenes and all of that, and then the monitoring. By the time it gets into production, how relevant is that model? Is it running? Is it producing results the way you trained it to? Has the data gotten old enough that, that, that new values could have altered the production or the capability of that model? Again, manual process of retraining is again an exhaustive process. So all of this spans week, weeks or months and results in poor insights, poor manual decisions. Guess what? For those of us that are in the analytics business, that's bad news. Am I speaking to the choir or somebody else? A few words of amen are all right. So I know I'm preaching to the choir sometimes. So here's a typical life cycle. I like this because on the left-hand side, you'll see the perceived value of analytics to the business. Now, the business is our focus. When you start with the traditional ways of data discovery and deployment and go through the life cycles of you know, preparing the data to building models, rewriting, and deploying models manually, a model is not in production sometimes upwards of six months to maybe even a year. And it's not producing actionable insights or revenue to the business for more than a year. What does that do? It causes frustration on the business side. And this is something that's really relevant. So in order for us to be successful, the goal needs to be, and you realize today I'm talking about how to get it operational, how to move things faster so that business can actually see value. The core message that I want us to assimilate today is we need to make sure that our focus remains on turning insights into decisions. You'll see a plethora of challenges in the analytics ecosystem today. There are breakaway organizations, people developing models on one side while the business is doing their own thing on the other side. Then there's the prioritization and automation process where decision making is happening in one side, whereas model building is happening on another, and both are not talking to each other. Clear decision rules are not captured up front. So you've used the model to calculate and assimilate what the result should be, but the business somehow does not agree with those triggers. They're making decisions based on other endpoints. And continuous, quick, and refined decision-making process is not part of a holistic organization today. Those are challenges that we are faced with. Now, if it all sounds like doom and gloom, hold on a second. I'm coming up with a solution that's not just trying to sell what we've got. I'm, I'm going to give you an open framework that if you would build your anal analytic organizations starting ground up or from where you are and you make progress towards that, you can ensure measured success. And that's the goal that we are trying to achieve. So let me shift our focus a little bit. Here's the new jargon that you're going to hear over and over as the year progresses. Data doesn't change your organization, decisions do. Can we all say out loud decision? Beautiful. That's a key word that I want us all to remember. Decision, every decision that you derive out of your business data is something that can either increase opportunities in your business, reduce cost, it can add more customers to your spectrum, and those are the decisions that business really resonates with. That's what they're trying to do. So all AI ecosystems needs, need to turn their focus towards what we call on making the right decisions in the moment for every moment. Automating and scaling your decisions with powerful and trusted analytics. That's all you need to do. Take your analytics and make sure it connects with a decision endpoint in your organization's breadth and depth. And you will ensure success to start with. Give you some examples. Should we approve this loan? That's a decision. Is this a fraudulent transaction? Is this machine about to experience defect? We've all heard about this. Is this a valid claim? What is the next best action for this customer? How should we price this product? These are all decisions that businesses spend time over. And the more close our analytics gets towards deriving outcomes focused on these business outcomes is where we'll go. Now, here's the other side on the analytics spectrum. Now, you've got the decisions on one side. There are decisions to be made in terms of model deployment quantification questions. So when you're trying to deploy a model, and I'm not going to go through all of these, but just take one or two. How effectively can you scale up or down a model that was trained on 1 million data sets to 300 million rows? That's a simple question, and yet it's a very valid question. All of a sudden, the model starts to function differently once you start increasing the scale. How will you test your open source code to ensure it will operate at scale? Or simple open source licensing issues. 
Sometimes you might deploy an open source model on edge on a device and then later find out that you have signed an agreement that if it were to be production data used for revenue recognition, a telco company just went through that, it's no longer valid as an open source license. You've now got to pay up for it. And so those are things that you have to check and balance so that your analytics ecosystem is successful. The solution, finally. Let's look at this. What we need is to focus on accelerating innovation. The key there is to be able to choose certain drivers that will enable us to shorten that graph, so to speak. I'll get back to that graph that I showed you and show you where we can make difference along the line. Now, if I'm getting too tech talky, don't worry about it. We'll get to a demo where I'll show you how we try and do all of these things, all right? For some of us geeks in the room, is, are there any geeks here? So-called geeks to speak. I do have a demo that's beautiful, and I'm going to show you how you can not only take analytics, but bring it to scale, and how we do it, and how you can deploy it on edge, in the cloud, across the devices. So we, we are in the age where we call pervasive analytics. What does that mean? We follow the data. Analytics can be everywhere where the data exists. It can exist in database. It can exist on-prem, in the cloud. It can follow in, in devices that are sitting out there. And with the proliferation of the 5G spectrum, you can see analytics pretty much deployed anywhere. And so the ability to create a model that can run instantly once you've got it deployed across multiple different event streams is important to every organization. So in order to be able to do this as a solution, you need to be able to accelerate the innovation scheme. And on get on the right side, you need to be able to bring down the risk quotient. What happens if the wrong model gets deployed? What kind of governance can I enforce? So today, you'll also see something that we showcase as what we call a workflow. Now, the best way to, to eliminate errors in deployment is by the use of what we call monitored workflows, which means you've got checks and balances as you go along that are gating things that enable you to ensure that your model is accurate and it's getting into production when you do that. There are various methodologies that will enable you to do that. So in short, let me, let me show you, acceleration of innovation happens by enabling your ecosystem to work with more data, more types of data. If you've seen an expansion of data, how many of you in your organizations have seen data triple or quadruple in the last four or five years? Get ready, you're going to be hit with another huge tsunami of data coming at you. Because 5G is not yet got started. Once that starts happening, bring your own device is going to be taken over by all kinds of devices talking to each other. The, un the understanding capability of that data also has to grow simultaneously. So you need to be able to have visual metrics, visual data boards, dashboards, to be able to see and be able to analyze that data. Build better models faster. Now, we are also coming into the age where we've got self-model building capabilities, where you can throw data at a particular tool, and it can automatically create models for you that you can then take and customize and build. We are in that age. Collaborate seamlessly across teams. That's the biggest challenge today. The data team does not talk to the analytical team. So bringing it all together causes you to accelerate innovation. And again, on the other side, in order to be able to operationalize this analytic spectrum, you need to be able to, to come into a place where you can actually have, at an enterprise level, you're able to scale going from a small level. If you build it for one department, it should be scalable globally. And then you, you need to be able to manage your model inventory. That's the other thing. We've got so many models in our organization now, we don't know what does what and how efficient is one over the other. Am I correct? And then, the ability to monitor those models, quarter over quarter, year over year, month over month, and come up with results so that if a model's accuracy decays, you're instantly able to either retrain a particular model and bring it into accuracy, and then redeploy, or you're able to do something that is of greater value in, in redesigning that model completely and bringing it to speed. And then a centralized analytics governance that shows you where your artifacts are. So those are the important parts. Now I said that the confluence of this from the left to the right, turning insights into decisions, if you only stuck with the left side of the quadrant, which means ignoring the, the, the little round wheel with the rules, the decisions, action, and results, then you've stayed on the left side of analytics, which is pretty good. You've, and that's what many of the major corporations have done in the last four to five years. 
Analytics is still at its infancy stage. And so what you will see, like I said, you know, that, that there was a reason why I made all of us say that word decisions, is the leaping into decisions, the effectiveness of an organization, the measurability of how much cost did I save, how many new customers did I bring in, that's going to form the rules by which these models live by. And so that's going to create greater value as we go into this. In short, the real perceived value of analytics can only happen if we shorten the time to do discovery in data. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. A platform-centric approach is the best approach. If you can have a way in which all of this can be orchestrated around a platform approach, then you've got control from the data layer to the discovery of that into the deployment and also marrying those models with business decisions. So as you can see here, if your organization is struggling with, we started an analytics project 12 months ago, and our models are still making it, yeah, you know what, maybe they might get into production a month or so from now. And business is calling you and saying, we don't think the value of analytics that we're spending on all those servers and all the cloud that you've spun up is really up to snuff. And I would seriously ask you to look at an ecosystem where you can shortcut the time for discovery and data and focus on your analytic ecosystem. That's going to change the operationalization and enable business to have value faster and better. So this is just a chart, it's not, but the, but the core, the, the numbers are not rocket, they are not science, they are just numbers to say that you're going from preparing data and exploring, that's where a, a lot of the time has been spent in the past, to moving into a place where you're focusing on actually registering a model putting it into production, testing its effectiveness, and then allowing business decisions to be made by it. If the focus is on that in a platform-centric manner, then we are off to the races and winning. So let's talk a bit about the model lifecycle, and I'm setting you up to show you uh, the demo that, that'll come up in a little bit. The model lifecycle starts with building projects. You know, you register candidate models. You're going to compare those models one with another. You'll select a champion model, which will obviously be the model that'll run in production. Validate that model, you can freeze the version, you deploy that model, and then again you retroactively publish and score and monitor model performance. The ability to retrain a model or bring in another new model should also be part of that analytic ecosystem that you're building so that you can garner success. There are various role plays or roles that would have to participate in such an, such an analytic ecosystem. So while you're building your team, give consideration to the fact that organize that your organizational capability lies within the fact that you have various roles assigned to each of these. Have an analytics lead whose core focus is to organize and manage your analytics ecosystem, which means the data, the availability of the results, the reporting, and the capability around that. Have a validation officer or an analytics validation officer to test and validate models. This is crucial because they have oversight over how each model is performing and for what use case it, it, it depends on. Then. Your model publishing and scoring can be handled by either an application developer or database expert. That role can be taken over by them. Why? Because they're dealing with the endpoints. They know how that data can be consumed. And then have a specific model steward whose organizational job is to, and these are best practices we're sharing after having seen organizations start. In fact, uh, at SAS, we serve 94 of the top 100 banks on this planet use SaaS for modeling techniques in, in fraud and in the investigation space. The ability to monitor model performance is one of the key things, and to be able to keep that in the forefront so that your organization knows which model is performing at its peak. So pay attention to these gaps. Are we today evaluating how any model that I've produced in the last six months to a year is currently performing? Do I know that? Secondly, do I have all my models either deployed or cataloged in a consistent ecosystem? If that's not the case, we are setting ourselves up for failure. Because there's tons of money that we've spent in developing these models that we've not harnessed value out of. Then avoid the perpetual development trap. How many of you have seen this trap? We start a model and then it keeps on developing and it's still developing but it's never made it into production. Make sure you have a cycle where you can stop that 
and at least have some results that you can show the business every quarter or every cycle that your, 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 your project is. Ensure integrity and transparency of models. This is a huge, huge, huge area. I can't talk enough about it. So we need to see where we can actually see the, the effectiveness of the models in terms of interpretability. One of the key things that people are struggling to do is models have been written, but people don't know why those decisions have been made. Why is a model scoring a certain thing a certain way? What kind of biases went into the data that trained the model that it's now? I mean, think about the government. If they've got biased data that's, in, that, that's the inflow of a model, it is going to be profiling people based on the same gender bias or social bias. Am I right or wrong? So if that's happening, then we've got a serious problem. We need to make sure that we are focused on model interpretability and explainability, and that's very crucial. And then again, how often are we retraining the models? Are we doing it on a six-month cycle? Are we doing it on a quarterly cycle? We need to have a measurable quantum to do that. And these are just some of the factors. So I'm going to come into the place where we're going to look at a demo. Some of this is SaaS technology, but not all of it. Right? We are looking at something that we use in SaaS, SaaS Studio. We've got a, a plethora of visual programming interfaces where we can build models on the fly as you go. How many of you have heard or seen of that? If you have not, you can, you can talk to me or talk to... Uh, just, you, you, can, you can just go to SaaS website or talk to me after and we'll be happy to show you more. Then we also have open source models in Python, R, Java, Lua. Models can be built using a plethora of techniques, and that's why in my focus today, I'm not trying to be sassy, although I do try to be sassy, <laughs> in a sense. My goal today is to try to come up with a common sense approach that we as practitioners of AI can succeed together. We are in this business together. And so the goal is to showcase what we have built, and this is not just one, one area, but if you build it in syndication like this, it is a consistent mechanism to succeed. All of these models can be ingested into what we call model manager, right? And then, once you have a centric place where you can catalog and store your models, the next step is to be able to run them, compare them, be able to do various things with those models, and then with a click of a button, able to push that into production or activate them. And that's the key goal of the demo today. You can, you can productionalize it by pushing it to batch, you can push it to Spark, you can push it to a container, some, something sitting on your desktop or Docker, or you can even use it as a REST API, publish it so that some application can consume it as a container. What I'm not going to show you is something that I'm going to just show you in the next few quick click-throughs. I'm not going to talk about embedded AI and automation of data. We're not going to talk about pipelines. We're not talking about feature engineering. All of these things are all part of the regular model development life cycle. We're not going to talk about open source code in SaaS, right? You can embed open source, do all of that. We're not going to talk about model comparison or how we're going to compare. Like you can see four different models in open source. Not talk about hyperparameter tuning. These are all day-to-day -day things that a model developer does as part of their routine in building models. We're not going to talk about how you can experience or explain accuracy or interpretability or explainability for that matter using ice plots and various other things. So the core focus today is going to be taking your model that, is, that you have built already and putting it into production, comparing it with other models that you've built with open source, and be able to do that at scale. So I'm going to quickly go over to our demo here. What you're seeing here is what our centralized repository looks like. This is a collection of projects, right? A project can be a confluence of multiple models. They could be models that are built with Python. They could be models that are built in SAS, Lua, Java, whatever the case may be. Now, as you go in, you will see that there are different models in this particular project for which we are trying to assess home loan defaults. And then it's got a decision tree, a gradient boost. It's also got a Python model in there. And so let's take a quick look at one of these models. Now, there are different variables that each model is trying to look and assess. What is the likelihood of a home loan default? So these are all common variables that every model person who's, who's doing any kind of modeling will focus on, and you've got a whole bunch of models that can impact the results. Now you're looking at what type of model it is, the model property, whether it's a classification model, a clustering model, a forecasting model, and also whether it's under development, active, inactive, retired, whatever the case may be. Also take a quick look at the outcome variables. So you can target a binary a variable, you can have 
Um, the, uh, the output event can be classified so that you're trying to measure what it is. Now let's go and take a look at one kind of a model that, that you're looking at. So let's take a look. We brought in a particular Python model into this project. Now you can bring in raw Python code and basically score that out here and store it. What we cannot do today, which we are looking to do in the near future, is not directly import your Jupyter Hub notebook, but you can bring in PMML code and other versions of it, so that, that is possible. What we're doing here is comparing two model outcomes. So we're taking two models, a decision tree and a gradient boost, and we run a compare against the two. Tell me what performs better. And right there, it, it, it runs it based on your training set and your validation set, as you'll see here. And you'll see various characteristics show up. So it's giving you the outcomes based on the, the numeric values that you're seeing here. So all the values that you would look at in, in order to assess the comparative effectiveness of a particular model, whether it's Gini, whether it's the KS Euron statistic, whatever you're looking at, the ROC, all those values are paired up model over model. So you're able to compare which one's performing better right there. Also visually, on a graphical interface, you're able to see what the outcomes are in terms of a graphical, graphical outlay. So let's say you've, you've selected one of your models. You can either set it as a champion model, which means that's the one you wanted to go, in, go into production, or you can set it as a challenger model. Choose the event that you're actually doing, uh, that, you're going to, that, that, that is going to predict the outcome, and then you basically publish it as a champion or a challenger model. You can set that right here. So in the context of a project, you, you have the freedom to be able to set various things. Let's talk about versioning for a bit. Now people use GitHub, we know that, but versioning needs to be built into whatever ecosystem, and in our ecosystem here, every model is versioned as you go. So when you bring it into the system, it's automatically versioned, it's compared, and so you have that trustability quotient of going back to the previous version where something was performing one way or the other. Now, on the fly, also the capability to be able to score that model. So once you've done that, in this case, let's say your previous quarters, the model was performing in a certain way, and now you want to take a look and say, current quarter is not performing as it should because some of the economic criteria has changed. Let's start scoring this model and seeing what outcomes can happen based on a different set, like I'm doing here with a Q1 data set. Now, it did not allow me to do that because there was one particular field that was missing, so it made me select that field, went back, again, ran a test, and then it's going to show me the results of that new version that I'm looking at from a data standpoint. So scoring accuracy, consistency of how effectively you can score a model to see whether the output is consistent with what you're expecting, its performance or not, and then again, comparative between the previous quarter's performance can also be done on the fly. That's very important to study the effectiveness of what your model does, per se. Now we've taken this model and after having compared it, now let's look at something that we're going to do. We are actually going to take this model and use this to uh, use it and publish it into production. So what we are seeing here is the SAS micro analytics service is basically the endpoint that you're publishing your model to. A microanalytic service is, is an endpoint that an application can consume the data from. So once you've decided that a particular model is a champion model, all you need to do is, with a click of a button, you can productionalize this. Now, like I said, there's dangers to that, right? So what we are going to see in the next thing while we're doing this publishing here is what we call the workflow management, right? That is also critically important, but before that, we'll take a bit, bit of a look into the various performance metrics that you can look at. So this new model has been published. We're training it with, with data here. And once you've trained it, this model is ready to go into production.
Now, at this point, you can also compare the scores with the previous version of how it ran. And, and that is something that you need to be able to do with models that you're measuring the accuracy of. Going one step further, you can, from that very place, take a look at the various characteristics of the performance of that model. Again, as you can see here, if that model existed from quarter to quarter and if the data exists, it'll measure the value or the variable distribution, the characteristics, the stability, the lift characteristics, all quarter over quarter. And if you're measuring in month over month, whatever, whatever lineage you set it up to, the sensitivity, the ROC characteristics, the Gini index. So visually, this gives a modeler the ability to know and have confidence that, hey, my model that I've currently looked at and I'm designating as the champion in the ecosystem is performing at its peak performance. Once you have that confidence, then you basically initiate what we have as the workflow. Now, the workflow is already pre-built because you, 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 can, you can use it to bring in various models into the ecosystem and through a set of processes, enable its gating. So you can cause a particular event to trigger an email, for example, an approval chain. So all of these things allow you to have confidence that eventually what's being published into production is something that's of high quality, has been tested, and yet is acceptable by the business. So in this case, you see a very simple workflow. You import your model, you get the project ID, set a champion, you approve the champion. Some of these triggers are manual so that somebody needs to go in and say, I approve this model as the champion model. And that's what's causing the confidence in an organization so that failure doesn't occur. And business does not get crazy or mad at you when some model went into production and all of a sudden, you know, defects are turning up at a higher rate. That, need, that should not happen. And so a particular workflow stream that you construct, no matter what you use. Now, we are talking about our tool set, but if you build your models and deploy them using a workflow scheme, you reduce the errors of productionalizing them, right? So as you can see, in this demo, we are checking each step of the way. The import model, we go in and we say it's done. And so basically, it's a step-by-step -step that gets you through the model execution process to taking it into production. So somebody is going in here at this moment, and they're saying, yep, yeah, I accept this as the champion model. This is the version. I've checked it. It's complete. That particular step is done. So we've selected the decision tree as the final model that we are going to deploy. We've set that as the production model. We approve that as the champion. And we are publishing it now to the destination that we want to choose. Now again, I said there could be hundreds of destinations you're publishing it to all with a click of one button. You could publish it to memory, you could publish it to Spark, you could publish it to a device that's sitting on a router somewhere. You could do all of that from one central point. And that's something that your ecosystem needs to be able to support. Because with the growth of data and analytics, you're going to be able to have to deploy at scale. And that's what deploying at scale means. Now, going to the last little bit, all of this gives you confidence that you're doing what you're doing accurately. But a little bit more is actually cataloging the relationships that exist between all of these entities. A model is built based on a particular data set. It's, it's coming through an analytic process from data to discovery to deployment. So when that process of orchestration is happening, you want to be able to understand and see, in this case, the HMEQ data or the housing and mortgage data, you want to be able to see the correlation of your model with the associated data and also the associated projects that it belongs to and impacts. So there may be various domains. So what you do here, what you're seeing here, is a pretty, pretty sophisticated network map that actually shows you the proliferation of the dependencies of where your model is. For example, you pick, the, you pick one model over the other, but you can see that this home loan default program is based on four or five different models, and over the course of time, you can explain why one model was chosen over the other so that it was in production. That lineage, that ability to trace and track is crucial to the performance of an analytic ecosystem. I'm gonna stop here and quickly segue. I know I'm coming to the close of my talk track, but I wanna show you one or two more little things. 
what we are seeing here is the typical analytic ecosystem, right? Whether it's your marketing, financial, risk, sales, or IoT data, all of it has to go through a model ingest. Once it's been through that process, you're applying the power of analytics to it. It's not just basic reporting. It's now come to the analytics space. From there, it needs to go through whether it's being deployed into, uh, out as an API or in memory or whether it's in database or streaming or back into Hadoop. There is a consumer at the endpoint. All of this in today's world needs to be done with an approach to run anywhere, deploy anywhere. You need to be able to support an infrastructure with continuous integration and continuous deployment. So you need to be able to develop and change at the speed of the business requirement. Whether it's in cloud, whether it's on-prem, whether you're using a private or a public cloud, there are the three major providers, AWS, Azure, or a combination of, of some form of them. Whether you're using Kubernetes or Docker. So for the last little bit, I want to take another few minutes to show you something that we use called Jenkins to do a container type deployment of a model ecosystem, right? So in this case, what you're seeing, or shortly thereof, you're just seeing a basic Jenkins map. Now what you'll see is a flow that kickstarts a model deployment, but we're going to deploy it using a Docker container. So let's assume you've built a model and you want it to run on a particular Docker container and deploy it. We start, it pulls the code, so this is infrastructure as code. This is where model ops meets DevOps. So you're taking basically model building and then you're putting that as code so that it can actually go and do this automatically. Guess what? This is the nightmare that IT has struggled with for years, and this is the last mile in the analytics ecosystem. So if you're able to successfully bring it to this stage where your models are waiting to go into production, what you're seeing here is the code was built, the package, the code validation was done, that was tested, unit testing is happening. Now this particular part out here is registering model, that particular model that was deployed to SAS model manager. And that whole thing was done. So we basically on the fly created a Docker container that has that entire SaaS model that can now run as an endpoint and be able to deploy that into production. Well, in the Kubernetes world, that means very little downtime to your business customers. And that is exactly what you want to see. So when you go back in here into Model Manager, that model is already there. It has been in, in production. And it has actually worked through the orchestrated workflow steps that you had envisioned for that model governance process. So let me summarize by saying this. In order to have a mature and a modern analytics platform, there are a few things that we need to learn to overcome. The ability to manage a dynamic mix of analytic tools, whether it's R, whether it's Python, Lua, Java, whatever your ingest tools are to deploy models, they will change over time. But the ability to have an ecosystem that can adopt people that have those skills is crucial. Avoid the perpetual development trap. That's another best practice that you will see. Keep continuous development and continuous improvements as part of your innovation strike. Then there is a balance that you need to have between analytical freedom and IT governance. And this is getting closer every day. As DevOps starts to talk with model ops, they both begin to speak the same language. You are coming into a place where the key word is decisions. And that's important. Focus analytics on decisions. That's the power that we're going to see in the next year or two. Reduce costly data, that's, that's very important. And a consistent model governance and diagnostic practice. That's also important. So it needs to be centralized. You need to have a way to be able to see lineage. How you achieve it is not crucial. What tools you use, that's not the paramount thing. The fact that you actually do it will save you hours and hours of having to score through all that old model code and trying to understand if that's again relevant to your business problem today, right? Then the efficient use of resources for development and deployment. That means after having done all that deployment, you don't have to wait another six months till it gets into production. You need to be able to make a click, and it's right there. And if you are able to take these rules and encapsulate them into your analytic ecosystem process, I can, I can envision that you will succeed in what you're trying to achieve.